Welcome back to another episode of Harmonious at Lunch, the show that fuels your business success. I'm Brandon Gano, your host and guide through the world of harmonious business growth. Today, we're unlocking powerful strategies with industry experts to help your business thrive. If you're a business owner, entrepreneur, or executive, you are in the right place. Join me and our incredible guest today on the journey to clarity, growth, and success. It is time to revolutionize your approach to business. Let's dive in with another episode of Harmonious at Lunch. Welcome back. We got some more bite-sized business advice for you, and we are going to nerd out on this episode. It is my favorite topic, obviously, ever. We're talking about how ops and operations can save you and your business. You don't need any other advice on growing your business ever. It's all operations all of the time. And Maybe I'm a little biased. Maybe I'm not. Maybe we're both right. I have another fractional COO with me today, Toby Wyatt. Um, and obviously, that's why I'm excited for this episode, because that's what we do, too, fractional COOs. And we're totally going to nerd out. She's more nerdy than me. Maybe we'll find out why. Maybe we won't. But, Toby, welcome to the show. Good to have you here. So great to be here. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, so let's just let's unpack this. We I called you a nerd. It's not, it's not because I'm trying to offend you. You admitted to it real, yeah. real quick. What? Explain to the audience why you are a nerd, a self-proclaimed nerd. Well, so I, I have to call out the fact that you have the matrix, you know, in the background. So you I mean, noticed. that is Very nerdy, good. but I do Very think good. I beat you. So Motherload, uh, the name of my company, uh, when I was figuring out what I wanted to name it, I thought of cheat codes. I don't, the, the reason is for me, operations is sort of like the cheat code of a company. And so when um, a company does it well, they sort of skyrocket above those who are sort of grinding through um, dealing with all the operations in poor ways. And so in cheat codes, I went back to Sims 2 that I played over and over again. And the paste repeat on repeat was mother load in order to get a thousand simoleons each time. And I love to just build big houses. So I needed all the money I could get. And uh, so I think I would like hit paste until I got to like a million or two million or something. And then, um, so that's now become the name of my company. And then um, the hidden gem is that the logo underneath my company is the old up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, VA code from, um, I think even before uh, Nintendo, I think it was Konami. I, I can't remember who exactly it was from. I always thought it was from Nintendo, but I think it actually predates that. So yes, Toby is a giant nerd and uh, <laughs> we are not ashamed of that because that's that's what makes us so awesome. So it does. it's a perfect segue though, because the cheat code to business is operations. Uh, we are in 100% agreement so far. It is not marketing. No, sit back down, people. It is your operations and how you handle the flow of things that go through your company. And of course, everything that, that encompasses that. But I want to talk about how you got here because I, I always find it interesting. Mm -hmm. Fractional COO, that's what we both do. Fractional mm -hmm. anything, the path to get there is usually very unique and interesting. Um, and I know your history a little bit. So I know it's not just like you woke up one day and you want to be a fractional COO. Um, <laughs> I want, how did you get to be a fractional COO? Yeah. So, I mean, like any good generalist, and I, I will probably claim the title, um, you know, I had a zigzag career a bit before I've sort of landed where I am now. And um, I worked for a um, growing uh, startup, healthcare analytics startup. I, I say that loosely because it was actually a 20 plus year old company, but they completely changed directions of the company. And so I worked with them. I started as an executive assistant and I left as VP of operations. And so I had a huge growth curve there. I think that's pretty common where you get people that just sort of take more and more and more and then find themselves sort of running the show. And so um, that's what I was doing uh, a while ago. And then I sort of crossed into the other side of the universe to become chief of staff actually at two large corporate organizations. Um, and so definitely for me, the fractional hat, I definitely wear the fractional COO hat, but the lesser known one is I can also wear the fractional chief of staff hat. And so for those people who are aware of what that role is and does, it's sort of the care and feeding for the leader or the leadership team. And so it's the up and in, as I like to say, and then the, the COO title is sort of the, the down and out, the functional, the cost center, um, holder. And so they, they're they very complementary roles in some ways. And so for very small businesses, they can't afford one, let alone two. And so I definitely enjoy uh, wearing both of those hats. And my functional area that I love um, to dig the deepest in is HR. But like any good generalist, I don't want to be an HR person. I love uh, doing the, the multiple things that being um, 
an operator allows me to do. Yeah, I don't think HR people want to be in HR either. <laughs> I think sometimes that's true. I'm a fan of The Office. Uh, everybody loves to hate on Toby, right? Like nobody really likes HR. So let's just, sorry to all of you listening. We love you here. You have your place and we need to manage our people. So no, that's right. awesome. Um, no, thank you for that history though. And that's that's cool that you wear those two, well, really three hats, but um, those two complimentary roles. And you're right, it, when you get into a small business, it's you need it because you need that external help of a qualified COO level or executive level help, but you can't really afford it. Like these are expensive roles. Yes. So I, I love the fractional approach to being able to help a small business with a fraction of the price, hence the name. So tell me about the the companies you like, what's the size of company you typically work with? So I definitely work with small organizations. Um, right now, I'm focusing my efforts on companies that are under 25 employees, and that's sort of the biggest benchmark. I think in order to um, swallow the price tag, because you know we still do need to get paid, um, you probably need to be at 1.5 of revenue or more. And so those are the two sort of generic. Um, but people problems are people problems. Working together, collaboration, alignment; those are common across the board. So industry uh, agnostic for the most part. Um, and uh, definitely I like working with uh, two sort of specializations. One is companies that have been in business for quite a while. And some of my clients are, you know, 20 plus years in business. Others are, you know, a little bit less than that. But um, those who like have finally realized I don't need to work this hard or I'm just tired. Like I don't have any joy anymore or I want to sell my business in five years or, or so. And they might have gotten an inclination that their valuation is not going to be nearly what they thought it was if they are integral to the business, if they are sort of the center of everything. And so I can help sort of remove them from the center of everything so they can either go on vacation or sell their business or just go, get back to what they're good at and passionate about. Mm, yeah, most people... They wake up one day and they're like, I work 60 hours a week and that's not really cool. <laughs> I Why did I create a job? I thought I got away from this. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So many people build, they build a job and um, you know, it, they're, they're becoming a business operator, not a business owner when that's what yes. they created their business to be. Um, the path to get there is simple, but you need often need help navigating it. So um, I'm super passionate about that. I know you are too. And I want to unpack it. So when you start working with a company, what are some of the things that you're looking at in terms of the operations to really get someone to go from operator to owner as quickly as possible? Yeah. So, I mean, there are three things that I'm looking at and two I'll unpack a little bit more, but um, the first thing has to be communications. I have to look around and see what kind of communications are happening. Um, what's the feel of the communications, right? It's a lot of, um, soft skill sort of evaluation of really understanding what kind of dynamics do you have in the organization? What are the power dynamics? Who are your employees? How do they interact with you? What are their personality types? Um, what are you trying to accomplish? Are you trying to be a fast moving, you know, hard hitting organization? Do you just want to be a really great sort of family, if you will, and, and, and all the things that come with just really being people centered and employee centered in your company? Um, and so really just understanding all of that and what are the perspectives from the leadership and also what is the perspectives all the way down to the individual contributors, because sometimes there is real obvious lack of clarity. And so clarity is one of the first things that I need to establish, um, because without clarity, all your communications are going to be off. Any system that we build for you isn't going to work. So we've got to establish clarity across the board. What are the role clarities? What are the communication clarities? Do you have a communication strategy? And so that has to be just fundamental. But that's not easy to say, like, here's a, a thing to try tomorrow, right? Like, it's 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 a lot of really sort of diving in and, and asking the hard questions and listening very, very carefully to what's happening around. Um, the two other things that I think are just absolutely vital are... Um, what is the single source of truth for an organization? And I think this is something that I have heard the term being out there, but I don't think it's a broadly recognized term of this single source of truth or phrase, I guess. And um, it's where do you go for the right information? Where do you know that you're going to get the, the most recent update of whatever it is you're looking for? Where do you know that you're going to get the most accurate 
and up-to-date and reliable data on something. And so it, it's a little bit of a misnomer because you could have single sources of truth, but any given thing that I want information on, I should be able to know. I go here and this is where I find exactly what I'm looking for. And those have to be updated by somebody. They have to be owned by somebody, right? It's really important to keep that and standardize that. And so I have implemented uh, single source or single sources of truth for almost every organization I've walked into. And then um, the other thing that I really am passionate about is the fact that task management is actually a way more complicated skill than we give it credit for. And um, so we need to have some sort of tool, especially when we have collaboration involved. And so we spend so much in time, time in meetings and stuff, making them horribly boring meetings because we're really just trying to pass information that can be literally seen on a screen um, instantaneously at any time, um, which would be far more valuable than wasting everybody's time in a meeting. So um, communication, single source of truth, and task management, whatever that looks like. And it can look like a lot of different things at many different organizations, depending on what they need. Yeah, I think we've, well, we've all heard of task management. That one's easy. Communication's pretty pretty obvious. When you say single source of truth, I wanna unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of the Bible. That's my single source of truth. I don't think that's what we're talking about here. Like, <laughs> can you give me an example of what single source of truth would look like in a company, like what, what types of software or, or what that database would look like? Yeah, so um, sometimes it goes hand in hand with the task management system because you actually end up creating a task management system that becomes sort of the documentation of the company and of the company's full operations. And what I mean by that is if in your task management system you document, this is how I go about all of the processes that are going on because each of those are a task there, that can be a huge single source of truth for how we do invoicing you know, who owns what pieces of information. And then I am a personal fan of, of um, software like ClickUp that can partner um, task management with documentation. So ClickUp does um, like documents that interconnect with your tasks. And um, so like I could have an invoicing task and I can get as granular as I want with a task and subtasks and multiple tasks, whatever makes sense for how I like to process things. And then each of those things can be connected to a document that really provides the breakdown of this is how we do this activity. And so I think a lot of organizations truly forget to document some of the basic things. And then you get these annual processes, for example, that nobody really remembers the next year, unless you're relying on that same person to be in the same role next year. And they go, oh, ha, I did this thing last year at this time. I got to do that again this year. And that's so unreliable for so many reasons. And so when you have um, a task management system, it's a really great base for your single source of truth. The other one is um, an HR system would be another great example. Where do your employees go to make sure they get the latest information on benefits, on what their time off looks like, on what their pay is? There should be an HRIS system, even for the smallest of organizations. There's really no excuse at this point not to have your basic HR system, if it's a Gusto or a Rippling or, you know, Bamboo HR. I mean, there's just so many options out there that work for the very small organizations as well. So um, that's why you can have multiple sources. It doesn't make sense for me to store all of my HR data in ClickUp. That is a bad idea, but I can have single sources of truth to make sure this is where we go for anything that is employee related, benefits related, and then this is where we go for any sort of process that is the operations of the organization. And you can have, again, further from that, if, you, if there's a marketing department, where is their single source of truth? I would still say that for the vast majority of the operational arms of a company, that can be done in your task management system. And it's, easy, it's best if you can keep your single sources of truth to as few sources of truth as possible so that they are more collaborative and easier to update and everybody just sort of knows the rhythm of things. Yeah. So when you're, when you're starting to work with an organization, um, I'm sure you find that the owner is the obstruction to the single source of truth <laughs> most of the time. I think the quicker we can get to that truth, the quicker we can help that company out. So what is that? What do you usually walk into in, in terms of single source of truth and task management? And then what's that process to get those things built out? Yeah. 
So I think most CEOs would not agree they're the obstruction. Well, I think wrong, they okay. and they and they are, and you're right. Um, but because they are the single source of truth, right? That is the problem: is that they become the bottleneck for absolutely everything because they are the only one that sort of knows everything. But that also means they have to be involved in everything, right? Which is a disaster. Um, and I think that's the thing that when something's your baby and you hold on to it super tight, it can be very difficult. And I have found this to be true this last year. It's been fascinating how often I have watched my own operations of my own organizations and realized, oh my gosh, you would make a great client for yourself right now. What are you doing? Right? Because it's so easy to fall into these traps, especially when you're sort of like so fearful and so nervous about it. So I totally understand where this comes from. Um, but the, the breakdown of it is first you got to pull it out, right? You, it's, it's a lot of downloaded information. And so you got to know the people that, that ask the right questions. And so this is where an experienced operator really helps because they know the questions to ask. If you're waiting for sort of a fire to get created to realize you don't have information on something, right? You're now behind the curve and you've created some sort of either risk or cost or something. So um, you got to pull all that information out. And so somebody who has done a lot of especially small business operations knows how to ask the right questions. The other thing that I've seen is um, sort of death by spreadsheet. And so they're running their organization on like, um, I don't know, 20, maybe if you're lucky, interconnected spreadsheets, meaning like they, they somehow know about each other. Um, but oftentimes, like you have no idea, is, is this one? Wait, is this tab the one? Wait, what is this tab? Is this old information? What the heck is this? And and you just realize how much time and therefore cost is wasted on trying to figure out what you're even doing. And so it's it's just such a, a, a drain that, that can be solved. And so the solution is to get the information, to pick a system. And the way I do that is figure out how do you like to operate, right? Do you, are you all in um, Microsoft already? And do you need to be in, um, I hate Microsoft's project management tool, but you know, is that where you already are? And so you need to stay in there because that is the, the simple thing. Do you need an entirely new tool? Do you need a tool that does this and this? And there's tools that do all sorts of aggregation of things. Do you really wanna have like a keep notes that's collaborative right? Like something super basic. That's just a list. I don't care what works best as long as it can be adopted and it's sophisticated enough to solve the problem that you have in front of you. Yeah. It, it's, we always say with our clients, we're, we're software agnostic because it's gotta be what works for you, right. but it also has to balance efficiency. Like you can't, the yes. 20 spreadsheet thing. I laughed because it's so true. Like so many people are like, no, it's this piece of paper I have on my desk. This is where I keep my <laughs> systems. Yes. Oh, we, need, we need software. You're going to pick whatever you want, but it's not that. That's not software. Right. That's soft, floppy paper. That's not going to yeah. work. Um, so I'm going to toss your website on the screen here, motherload.biz. And it's also going to be in the show notes down below, wherever you're watching or listening. Um, but, you know, this the time flew by here. But I'm also curious about the, the other side of you, which is uh, mm -hmm. recently found out about at least. And yeah. I think a lot of business owners and entrepreneurs have this. For you, it's ADD. For a number of others, it's ADHD. Some some version of neurodivergence. That's the mm -hmm. the buzzword of the month. It seems like. Um, but I want to unpack that too because that it makes it really hard. Let me piss off the CEOs real quick, just to circle back on our other conversation. If you can't, this is this is what I say to people to really disrupt the way they think. If you can't take three months in a row off from your business without having a decline in revenue and profit, you're not a business owner. So we want to get you there as soon as possible. Yes. And what I'm about to say is going to get in the way of that. We have ADD or ADHD most of the time. We present the symptoms, which makes us change things all the time, which totally upsets our company. How do you go about managing that for both yourself, but also for your clients? Because this is very real in the workplace, not only for leaders, but also for every level of employee. We are just mm -hmm. so distracted. So what, is, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Um, so for me personally, it's been an interesting journey. So I did not consider myself, um, I didn't even consider the possibility of having ADHD, um, until my daughter got diagnosed. And so she got diagnosed a couple of years ago. And so that led me on a path of research and really understanding, you know, oh, well, I wouldn't typically say that her symptoms would match my understanding of ADHD, except for a few narrow things. 
and realizing that my, even as a trained educator with some special education training, had a very myopic view of what ADHD really was. And so it was really trained on what, how it presents often in, I don't know, eight-year-old boys is sort of my only view of what ADHD was. And so as I learned more, I realized more and more how some of this really applied to my life and, and the struggles that I've had. And, you know, I have accomplished great many things, so it hasn't limited me. But one of the things that was really important to understand is um, I, I heard it on a podcast that was talking about, yes, you can have these, especially women, commonly women who are very high functioning with ADHD and, um, you have to ask what the cost is, right? So it, it's not a matter of, can you, it's sort of like introverts and extroverts. Introverts can interact very well. It doesn't necessarily mean that when you interact with an, an introvert, you're going to, oh, wow, you're an introvert. Like I can really tell they may be the most personable person in a conversation, but it costs them something. It costs them energy to have that conversation versus an extrovert receives energy. And so for me to overcome the challenges that I have with ADHD costs me a lot of energy. And I think it's really important to understand that for a lot of leaders, because I think they are just grinding through thinking, this is just what has to be in order to have a successful business. And I want to definitely put out there that if you are expending an extraordinary amount of energy to run your business, you could be just in ne desperate need of an operator. That could be problem number one. And problem number two could be that you have either very strong ADHD symptoms or you have ADHD um, or some variant of it. And um, there are different solutions out there, whether you want to go medication route or not, right? Once you put a name and a label on it, you can get some help. And I think the three things that I talked about get greatly impacted with an ADHD leader. And I would put so much money on the fact that both operators and CEOs and leaders, vast majority of them have ADHD because I think it like this world pulls us in that direction because it's creativity, it's newness every day, it's all the things, it's the learning, right? So it's it's great. And um, so task management is huge because the more I have to keep something in my mental sort of cycles, the more energy it's costing. So as soon as I can get it out and have recurrence come at me versus me have to go at every recurrence, meaning a task that I need to do every week. Am I thinking of that all week to make sure it gets done on Tuesdays? Or is a computer program going to tell me, oh, hey, it's Tuesday. You have this thing you need to do. That is so much less energy burn once I'm comfortable with that system. I think um, a single source of truth, right? If I, I can retain a whole lot of information and what I sort of picture, if I'm going to age myself even bigger. My dad was a pastor. And so he used to have a huge Rolodex on his desk. Right. And what so you have all these that? cards. Oh my goodness. You don't even know what a Rolodex is. I know is. what a Rolodex is. I'm making, I'm making <laughs> the Sims 2 so and the a, Rolodex. You, yeah. We know your age. You're good. <laughs> exactly. So it's a wheel with a bunch of cards on it. So you can picture that if, if you're younger than certainly I am. And so it's a wheel with a bunch of cards on it. And so you turn the wheel to get to the card you're looking for. And I sort of picture my brain works like that a lot. And, and so I will constantly be spinning the cards in order to remember the cards. And so if I can create a single source of truth and a task management system, then that is saving me a huge amount of burn. And I think the third thing that I talked about was communications. And I think there's a lot of leaders out there who have ADHD, who are driven by a very different sort of core um, energy level and belief system. And just like, this is what it takes to live than people without neurodivergence. And it gets very hard to have conversations between a neurodivergent person who is not aware of the differences that a um, person without neurodivergence is bringing to a conversation and vice versa. So you really have to, like there's certain leaders I work with to say, you know, I don't think your employees understood what you said in that meeting because you really came at it from a perspective that they don't share with you. And so breaking down that, I think certainly with neurodivergent to non-neurodivergent, that can happen a lot. But truth be, truth be told, it happens between interpersonal people all the time, right? You're just, you need to understand their perspective. And so often we just sort of stew and sit in our own little bubble. Yeah, I mean, it's it amplifies everything, I think. Just like you said, I mean, communication is obviously foundational, uh, single source of truth. 
task management, all of these things, they're just amplified when you have something yes. else going on, um, which makes it all the more important and, and making it the best it can be will smooth everything else out. So we were right. Everybody else was wrong. Operations <laughs> will save your business. Um, and if you, if you need a fractional COO, Toby's the way to go. Focus on those three things. Uh, your four things, your, your communication, your task management, your single source of truth and your Bibles, most important single source. Of truth. <laughs> um, and you will grow your business with solid operations. Toby, thank you so much for being here. Awesome. It was, it was great. Great fun. Thank you, Brandon. For you watching and listening, make sure you subscribe. We want to make sure you don't miss a minute of this totally ridiculous show that we bring to you every single day of the week because we have a lot of fun and we want to grow your business also having fun. If you're not having fun in business, you're doing it wrong, seek some help. We're here for that 20 minutes a day. This one's a little long, but we appreciate you hanging with us. We'll see you tomorrow on the next episode of Harmonious at Lunch.